Greetings, class. Uh, let's do another Pearson's uh, correlation uh, problem. We're going to go right through and do the uh, we're going to do the computations, and then I would like to talk a little bit more about um, what all this stuff means. Okay, so um, here let's do another sort of a study. I wouldn't call it an experiment. <coughs> um, this is a study where we're going to ask people to tell us how many hours per week they exercise and then also uh, ask them their level of happiness on a Likert scale like we did in class, okay? So um, I use this example because I want the numbers to be easy to work with, okay? So um, they don't have to be this simple, uh, but this process that we're going to go through uh, can be used for any kind of um, assessment of whether there's a relationship between two variables. Okay, so the first thing I want to do here really is um, do my scatter plot, like I said before. Uh, it just gives us a little bit of a graphic representation of um, what the, you know the data. And so here we have hours of exercise per week. We'll call that our x variable. We'll call the Likert our y variable, okay? And so this is exercise here uh, on the x-axis. <clears throat> and we need to go up to 7. So uh, let's do this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Okay, and uh, I know that's a little bit small, but um, I'm assuming that you're good with with doing this kind of graph. I want to leave some room for the for the other uh, work. And then our Likert scale goes up to ten. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Okay. There we go. And so this is uh, subject number one, subject number two, subject number three, subject number four, and so on and so forth, all the way down, right? How many do we have? We have eight people this time, okay? So we'll keep that um, in mind. And uh, so the first subject, four hours of exercise and eight for happiness. The second subject, six for <coughs> exercise and nine Okay, and zero and four and two and seven, six and eight, okay, three and ten, <clears throat> seven and ten. And then five and five, something like this. Okay. So from that scatter plot, I'm wondering if you can tell me uh, whether you think this is a positive or <coughs> a negative uh, correlation. And if we sort of, you know, do this a little bit here, um, we can see that now in this case it's a positive slope. So we have a positive correlation as x goes up, y goes up in this case. And that's called a positive correlation because we have a positive slope in this case. Okay. Uh, we could also write this as x goes down, then we tend to have y values that go down. Okay. And so we are going to do a uh, Pearson's Pearson's R, which is sum of products over the square root of the sum of squares for x and the sum of, times the sum of squares for y. Okay? So, let's do first things first. Let's do our sum of squares for x here. Let's do our sum of squares for y, and oh, I should have left a little bit more room here. 
<clears throat> I know eventually I'm going to have to get an X times Y column here. Okay, I'm going to have to do an X times Y column. Um, but let's do first things first. And um, I'm going to let you do the sum of squares for X and the sum of squares for Y. And um, <coughs> we can put those in here when we are ready to. So I would suggest, why don't you put the um, video on pause and see if you can get the sum of squares for X and then the sum of squares for Y. Okay, so let's pause right now and we'll see if uh, you can get that because you'll need to do that. Okay, so the sum of squares for X is 38.88. So hopefully you've got that number for sum of squares for uh, X. Sum of squares for Y is 32.00. <clears throat> so those numbers will go into there eventually. Okay. Our X times Y column, so 4 times 8, 32, uh, 6 times 9 is, uh, what is it, 54, um, 0, and uh, 14, and uh, 48, and <clears throat> um, let's see. 15, 70, 25, okay? Because remember, our sum of products equation is the sum of the x times y column, okay? And we're going to subtract from that the sum of the x's times the sum of the y's, oops, divided by n, in this case n is going to be um, 8. All right, so then we need to get those values. And so the sum of x is 33. The sum of the y's is 56. Multiply those together, divide by 8. And then the sum of the xy's, of course, is this sum. And that's 258. Okay. So the sum of products in this case is 27. Are you with me here? X times Y, give us this value. This is 33, this is 56. Multiply those together. Divide by 8. In this case is 27. Okay. And so, let's can we do this here. Our Pearson's R value is 27. 38.88. Thirty-two, thirty-eight point eight eight times thirty-two. I'm not going to forget to take my square root, okay? And so our R value then in this case is, um, let's see, where's my calculator? <clears throat> thirty-eight point eight eight times. 32 equals, take the square root, okay, is 27 divided by 35.27. In this case, we have a positive <coughs> R value. And I knew that was going to be the case, uh, given the shape of our curve or the shape of our graph, right? 
So I get 35.27, 0.766, something like that, 0.77, something like that. That is our calculated value for this group of data, okay? Um, I knew it was going to be positive, so that's a good thing. And when I do correlation, uh, I, I don't uh, just leave it blank uh, when it's positive. I actually put a positive sign there, and that's partly related to the fact that, um, like I said in the last video, Pearson's R really gives you two pieces of information. The sign tells you the type of relationship, and the value, the numerical value, tells you the strength, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But we do have to compare this calculated value <clears throat> to our critical value for R, okay? And so the critical value in this case for R, remember the degrees of freedom for Pearson's R is not n minus 1, it's n minus 2. <clears throat> and the n here, number of pairs or the number of um, points on your scatter plot. Okay, so there's 8, and we're going to subtract, <clears throat> we're going to subtract 2 from 8, excuse me. And so the degrees of freedom are 6. And I'm going to look in table B6 now. I have my book here. I'm going to look for the critical value. Pearson's R. Let's see. Let's see. Appendix B. And there's B6. So for six degrees of freedom, for alpha level of 0.05, the critical value is point. Seven oh seven, okay. So our value of 0.77 surpasses this, and so we're going to say that we have a statistically significant correlation <clears throat> between hours of exercise and happiness. Okay. And again, we can put our R value there with six degrees of freedom, 0.77. Okay. With a P less than 0.05. In this case, <clears throat> the P less than 0.05 means that the probability that you would see um, this kind of relationship by chance, the probability that you would see this just by chance is less than 5%. So I'm going to say there's a statistically significant correlation. Now, we will talk more about what that means um, in terms of how you interpret that. I want to talk more about that maybe at the end of this video or the next video <coughs> because it's very important that we um, know how to interpret it because it is often, 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 often misinterpreted. Okay? We just see that as exercise goes up, happiness goes up. In fact, I should put in here a significant positive correlation because I always kind of tell people when you say a significant correlation, it could be positive or negative. Of course, we indicate that here, but it doesn't hurt to put it in there. Okay? So, hopefully this uh, made sense. When you do a correlation, you're going to need to get this column. That's a new column, right? The x times y, because that's going to go here. Sum of squares for x, sum of squares for y. This is the total for the x's. So we're just going to add these together here. Total for y here. 
divide that whole thing by 8. So you can practice by going through this again, uh, you know, starting new, going through it again. Um, there's also other, there's problems in the, in the back of the chapter you can, you can use um, for practice as well. <clears throat> but we have the alcohol and GPA example. We have this example. I didn't want to let you guys down. I, I did one negative correlation and one positive correlation. In this case, they were both statistically significant. If we had done this problem and we got a, a, a correlation of, let's say, 0.53, then we wouldn't say that it was statistically significant. That something like that could happen just by chance. Okay. Now, I've said a couple of times that Pearson's R has really two components. The sign, which tells you the type of relationship, right? So in this case, as X goes up, Y goes up. Or as X goes down, Y goes down. When the, var when the variables are changing in the same direction, we call that a positive correlation. With our alcohol and GPA, the variables were changing in opposite directions, right? As alcohol intake went up, GPA went down. Or as alcohol intake went down, then GPA goes up. That's called a negative correlation. So that's the sign. And then <clears throat> the numerical value tells us about the strength. And I want to talk about that a little bit more. I think the book does a good example, or it does a good uh, job at giving you some more examples. And by the way, this is, uh, I think this is chapter 16. Um, so we're going to cover Pearson's correlation. There's also Spearman's correlation. Do not worry about that. There's also something called the point by serial uh, relation or something like that. Don't worry about that. Pay attention to my videos, right? And look for the Pearson's R discussions in the book, okay? I'll, I'll get some more information about that for you in terms of, of pages. But we're going to sort of pick and choose for the rest of the semester what we're doing. I'm focusing on Pearson's. Um, so what do I mean when I say strength, right? The positive and negative tells you the type of correlation. What do I mean when I say the numerical values related to strength? Well, let's take a look, okay? Here are some scatter plots, and um, you're seeing some uh, different patterns of how these points are spread out, right, in the graph, X and Y. Um, in this case, we see that there's a negative slope, so we can assume that this would be a negative correlation. All right, this is a negative correlation here. This would be a negative correlation. This would be a positive correlation. This would be a positive correlation, okay? This one, wow, it's really hard to tell. I can pretty much guarantee you if these were real numbers and we did the analysis, this wouldn't be statistically significant, okay? Um, now, when we look at the correlation coefficients, I'm just going to make these up right now, folks. I'm just going to make these up, but I'm going to show you um, how the numbers change as the pattern changes. If we have all of the um, points along a straight line, then this would be an R value of positive 1.0. Okay, you would never see that in the real world of data. <clears throat> that's just kind of made up. Okay, but that's a that's a magnitude of one because what the strength tells you is how close to an exact straight line the points are. Okay, so if they're right on a straight line, then the R value is one. Um, this one I've tried to show you that. It's along a straight line, but in this case, there's a negative slope, and so that would be um, a negative one for the correlation. Now, if we look at, let's look at this one, 
right? And we see, well, I mean, it's pretty strong, but it's not all on a straight line. It sort of looks like what we just did. So maybe this one would have an R value of, excuse me, this one looks like the alcohol one, right? This would have a negative slope, so it would have a negative value. And maybe it would be something like negative, I'm just making this up, right? Negative uh, 7, 4, let's say. Okay. And if this is 7, 4, then this one, which is a little bit more spread out from that straight line, negative, still negative. So this might be a negative 0.56. The more spread out from a straight line, the smaller this value will be, okay? The more spread out, the smaller this value will be. So these are tighter, so we're gonna have a larger <clears throat> numerical value. And we look up here, right? This is even more spread out than this one. So this one might have, it's positive, a positive, Again, I'm just making this up for illustration. Maybe that would be positive 4, 2. Okay. <clears throat> this one is called a stronger correlation than this one. Okay. The sign just tells you the type of relationship it is, positive or negative. The value tells you how strong it is. So this is a stronger correlation, closer to the straight line. Okay, and of course these two are sort of artificial. This one, wow, I can't really um, see any kind of trend in terms of positive or negative. Um, it might, I mean, it's very rare that you would see a correlation of zero. <clears throat> it's just, <coughs> excuse me, very rare. Very rare to see ones, very rare to see zero. Um, so I'm going to maybe call this um, positive 0 0.03, okay? It's pretty damn close to zero, and it's never going to be bigger than our, you know, something like this just wouldn't be bigger than our critical value. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay? So two pieces of information coming from our uh, correlation coefficient. The sign tells you whether it's negative slope or positive slope, and then the, va the numerical value tells you whether how strong the relationship is, that is how close to an exactly uh, straight line the value is. All right? Now, you'll notice I mean, if there's absolutely no correlation, if there's nothing here, it'll be zero. It's just rare to see exactly zero. And you'll see if it's along a straight line perfectly, you're going to get a R value of one. And in fact, there's a reason that it can't go more than one. Okay, there's a reason for that. And it, um, zero represents no correlation. One represents a perfect correlation. Because I want to talk about the conceptual basis of Pearson's R. And of course I'm going to ask this on the exam, for God's sakes, right? We do the computations, we talk about the conceptual. We do the computations, talk about the conceptual. Because when you leave my class, guess what's going to happen? You're going to do all of this on a computer. The computer will do what? It will compute the numbers for you, but it's not going to explain the numbers to you, probably. Okay, so let's take a look at the conceptual basis of Pearson's R. Hey, look at that. Pretty convenient, right? So Pearson's R, I mean, if we do this... sum of the products, which takes into account both x and y, right? It takes into account both x and y taken together. And then we have 
even though we're multiplying these two things, what we're doing is we are <clears throat> calculating the variability of the x values, and then separately we're calculating the variability of the y's. Okay? If we go back to our data, <clears throat> this sum of squares for x, 38.88. That represents the variability of these numbers. That's it, okay? Sum of squares for y calculates the variability of these numbers, okay? And so it's x and y taken separately, and here's the number, here's the numbers in our data set. And so if we look at the bottom, this is the total variability in the data set. That's it, that's all there is, that's all there is. Okay, sum of products measures the covariability, and here are the covariability of x and y taken together. Okay, this is the total. There is no more variability. This is it. The covariability <clears throat> is always a subset of the total variability. I'm going to say that again. Listen carefully, right? The covariability is always a subset of the total. That is, this number is always smaller than this number. Always. It's one of the few times I can say, you know, when people say, is it always that way? Is it always that way? I'm going to say, yes, it has to be. This is always a subset of this. Now, if the lines, or if the points are on exactly a straight line, then this and this are equal. Then this and this are equal. If the top is equal to the bottom, then we have a correlation of what? Of 1. Okay? You have to think about this relationship. This fraction, this ratio is always a relationship. We've talked about that before, right? Um, so if this is equal to this, you can have 1, but typically the covariability is going to be a subset of the total. So that means that this is typically going to be under 1. If the covariability is equal to this, <clears throat> then it will be 1. If it's some subset, then it's going to be something less than 1. So I always tell people, Here's the range of possibilities for Pearson's R. That is anything in between 0 and 1. If this is 50% of the total, it'll be 0.5. If it's 40% of the total, it'll be, right? So on and so forth. And so the Pearson R value can only take on values from 0 to 1, and it can be positive or negative, right? I mean, that tells you about the type of relationship it is. This tells you about the strength. I uh, reviewed a stats book a couple of years ago for, for a publishing company, and the author was saying that <clears throat> Pearson's R value can go from negative 1 to positive 1. And I wrote to the editor, and I said, well, this is technically true. This is technically true. That's the whole range um, of values that the R value can take. But the problem is you lose the, con the conceptual meaning of this. Covariability over total. So it goes from 0 to 1, and it can be positive or negative. And when I'm teaching stats, I want students to understand the concept. Technically, this is true, right? But you're losing the meaning of this... Um, ratio, covariability versus total variability, okay? Now, the covariability of x and y, because um, this is, I think, easier to understand, the total variability, because I'm taking all the variability for x, taking all the variability for y, and that's it. That's total variability. What the hell does the covariability of x and y mean? Well, it means 
it, it actually captures the relationship between x and y. Because let's suppose, um, let me take this person here and this person here, okay? Let me just switch these two numbers. Now, what I would like you to do, I'm not going to do it here. What I'm going to, what I'd like you to do, just switch these two. Keep these where they are. Okay, switch these two, and redo your scatter plot. And I want you to compare that new scatter plot to the one that we just did here, and you'll see that the pattern really looks quite different, okay? It really looks quite different. Even though, listen carefully again, okay? If I switch these two numbers, what's gonna to happen to the sum of squares for y? If I switch these two numbers, what's gonna to happen to the sum of squares for y? Absolutely nothing. It's the same numbers. I'm just switching the position, okay? If I switch just these two numbers, what's going to happen to the sum of squares for x? Well, absolutely nothing, right? So what I'm saying there is the total variability will stay the same. It will be, uh, what was our number on the bottom? Our number on the bottom, oh, here we go, 35.27, okay? 35.27 will be our bottom number. If I switch these two, and please do the scatter plot, right? It only takes two minutes. You'll see how different the scatter plot is. And now what's going to happen is sum of squares for x doesn't change. Sum of squares for y does not change. What changes? Well, this changes. And that is how the variables move together, right? How they're linked. And so the sum of products tells us the covariability of x and y, how they're covarying, how they're moving together. This is x by itself. This is y by itself. It makes up the total. Okay? Hopefully that makes a certain amount of sense. Hopefully that makes a certain amount of sense. Okay? Um, one more thing. Um, one more thing. Oh, let me do this. Now, the critical value, if you take a look at the um, B, table B6 for the critical value, what you will find, and, and please take a look at this, okay, because it's very important that you know this. What you'll find is the critical value decreases as the degrees of freedom increases, right? The critical value decreases as the degrees of freedom increases. And we're going to start getting into our tales of caution for Pearson's uh, correlation. Because suppose that we had, suppose that we did a study with 102 people, okay? That's still a very small uh, number of survey respondents. 102, that's not very many, okay? But suppose we did that, 102. We did our calculations, and we had a Pearson's R value of, um, let's say, negative 0.24, okay? And remember the graphs that we looked at, you know, if we have negative two, four, it's getting pretty, uh, you know, the points are, are kind of far away from a straight line. <clears throat> so the computer just printed this out. Now I'm going to ask you, is this a statistically significant, is that a statistically significant R value? Now, I would bet that if I ask a hundred psychology professors, if this was statistically significant, they would probably, 85% of them would say no. But let's look at the critical value. Let's look at the critical value. What are, degree, what are our degrees of freedom if we have 102 people? 
Well, it's 100 degrees of freedom, right? It's 100 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to say, well, what's the critical R value for 100 degrees of freedom? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at table B6. Everybody with me? So what is the critical value? Well, the critical value is 0 0.195. 0.195. So what does that mean? That means that this, yes, it is statistically significant. If we got this value with 102 people, okay, look up table B6. Here is the critical value, and we're beyond that, okay? So this would be a statistically significant negative correlation. Now, why would 85% of psychology professors say that this is not significant? Well, I mean, the larger your R value, the more likely it is to be significant. The larger your observed is, the more likely it's going to be significant. That's, you should know that, you guys. Um, but why do so many people, why would so many people say that this is not significant? Well, I have a hypothesis. I'm not sure it's right, but psychology professors all took this course. They all took Psych 211, and they all took two semesters of statistics in graduate school, at least. I took three. Um, why would they make that mistake? Well, because oftentimes we're using small sample sizes because we're doing this by hand in class, right? I mean, we did two. One, one had nine people. The other one had eight people. We still did the, the computations, and we were able to compare it to a critical value. But when you're doing a, a study with this many people, the critical value is only this. And so this would be statistically significant. I think the reason that a lot of people mistakenly think that it wouldn't be significant is because they've only experienced correlations with small data sets, right, from class. Remember what I said, I don't know, it might have been the second week of class. We're going to use small data sets because I want you to get some practice with math. We're going to do this stuff by hand. But... Um, anything we're going to do with small data sets, we could do with huge data sets as well. We could do a correlation with <clears throat> 2,700 people. You know, the Center for Disease Control might do a study where they look at 5,000 people. You can imagine how low the critical value would be. The reason it's so low is because when you have that many data points, the probability that you're going to get any kind of trend is so small. So that if you get some kind of trend, you usually mean something. Okay? So always, don't just look at the value of the R. We always have to compare it to a critical value, right? And as the sample sizes get larger, the critical values get smaller and smaller and smaller. <clears throat> um, another thing, when we do a study where we're looking at correlation, this is called Pearson's R. It's the correlation coefficient. But the next step would be to do a value called R squared. This is called the coefficient of determination. So let's do the R squared for in this case, let's do our R squared for this. And R squared is just R and you square it. So 0.24 squared. So this is 0 0.0576. Okay. When you multiply decimals, they get smaller, right? And this is usually expressed in percentages. That tells you the percentage of the total variability that's explained by the covariability of x and y. It tells you the percentage of the total variability that's explained by the correlation. Okay, It's the percentage of the total that's explained 
by the correlation. This is a statistically significant correlation, but it only explains about 6% of all the variability in the data set. Let's go back, let's take a look at the other one we just did. We did, right, for our exercise in happiness. Let's get R squared here. Let's get R squared, so we're gonna do 0.77 squared. 0.5929, usually given as a percentage. 59.29%. If we have a correlation this size, it's explaining 59% of the variability. So 59% of the variability in happiness is associated with the amount of exercise. Okay, It's the percentage of the total variability that's explained by the correlation of x and y. That's called the coefficient. It's called the coefficient of determination. Okay. By the way, this five percent here has nothing to do with the alpha. Has nothing to do with that p. It just tells us. That's why I wanted to do this example as well. We're just squaring this value. It tells you the percentage of the total variability that's explained by the correlation. Same thing here. If we go back to our alcohol, I forgot what our, uh, what was it, 0.85? So for our alcohol for 0.85, that would explain about 72% of the variability. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see. I think. I'm going to leave it there. Um, the next video, uh, which will be the second to the last video, the next video we're not going to be doing any computations. So practice this. Let me know if you have any questions via email. Um, I want to talk about how we interpret further these uh, Pearson's uh, correlations because they are very often misinterpreted and in fact you have to be very careful because people will try to convince you uh, that their way is the way to interpret it and it may or may not be and we'll, t we'll talk about that um, some more in the next video and it'll be tie-dye Friday so if you have your tie-dye um, make sure you wear it and you'll be kindred spirits okay so we're getting close to the end um, in the final, we'll talk about the final uh, in the next video as well. It's going to be just like the other exams. Um, it's basically it's going to count 25% toward the grade. So we have four exams. So I'm just going to take the average of the four exams. That will be your grade for the semester, and the final will be cumulative only in so much as you know we're still doing sum of squares. We're still doing you know, some of the same thing. We're still talking about variability. But I'm not going to go back to specific information from the past. Yes, you'll have to do some of squares. But um, in, in when we do the t-test, you have to get the means and all of that stuff. Um, but I'm not going to specifically go back to earlier information. So it's the final is really a fourth exam. Okay, th that's it. It's a fourth exam based on this stuff. And um, I'll give you a little bit more um, guidance about the chapters and the pages and all that stuff. So I'll see you on uh, Tie-Dye Friday. Take care of yourself.